Thank you. It's an honor to be here today. In terms of the subject matter of this panel, which in blunt terms is whether and how the UMC will continue to discriminate against LGBTQI people, who I am not is more germane to this conversation than who I am. I am not a United Methodist minister. As a young adult, I felt called to the ministry, but the year that I came out as a lesbian is the same year that General Conference voted to bar lesbians and gay men from ministry. As painful as that experience was, though, mine is a story of considerable privilege that does not begin to capture the ramifications of UMC policy for LGBTQI people. And by way of answering Stephanie's second question about what I want others to know that's important to me in this conversation, rather than tell you more about myself, I'm going to tell you briefly, very briefly, I promise, about two other people. The first is Dennis Akpona, a Nigerian gay man now living in the United States after receiving asylum here. Before coming to the US, Dennis endured violence and threats against him because he is gay. His own brother threatened to kill him, after which he moved to keep his address secret. He was arrested, tortured by the police, and then assaulted by other prisoners. He fled to northern Nigeria only to be threatened again, and so returned to Lagos. He was beaten up several times on the street, hospitalized once, and could not get a job because he had worked for an HIV prevention program and therefore could have been arrested simply because he had worked with gay people. You can read Dennis's story today on the Reconciling Ministries Network blog at rmnblog.org, and I urge you to read it. It was written with this audience in mind. Here is Dennis in a few of his own words. Nigeria is a very religious country. Nigerians will do whatever their pastor says, and every pastor in the country is preaching against gay people, saying we should be killed, we should be arrested. Gay people have nowhere to turn. Their families are anti-gay, the police are anti-gay, the churches are anti-gay. The only way to survive is to hide your identity. And then he adds this. I am one of the lucky ones, let that sink in, one of the lucky ones, who made it here to seek safety, but there are millions of LGBTQI folks in Africa who go through worse scenarios compared to what I went through. The church, which is supposed to be the safest place to go for refuge, is now the most horrifying place to be. I pray that one day the church, which includes the United Methodist Church, will realize the harm they have done to the LGBTQI community across the world. The other story comes from Reverend Greg Dell. When Greg was brought up on charges for performing a Holy Union ceremony for two of his parishioners, he received the following anonymous email about a week after he did an NPR interview during the trial. I am 14 years old. I live in Jackson, Mississippi. I think I am a homosexual. I have tried to get rid of these feelings of being attracted to other boys. Although my parents and my pastor do not know about my battle with this, it was clear to me that their judgment was that homosexuality was sin and a perversion of what God intended for his people. One night I prayed so hard that I was sick the next day and couldn't go to school. I finally decided that there was no hope. Nothing had helped. It seemed certain to me that I was hated or would be hated by God, my parents, my church, and probably everyone else if I was found out. I decided that the most faithful thing I could do would be to end my life. I decided I would do that on Friday after school. That way I thought my death would not mess up other people's lives as much as it would during the week. I came home from school and went to get the bottle of pills that I thought would end it. 
I had the radio on and I was listening to NPR. They had this story about a preacher who believed that God loved homosexuals as much as straight people. He was being put on trial for misleading people about homosexuality. I thought, this guy must be crazy. But then I thought, what if he's right? And I decided I would wait to see what the jury decided about you. The jury, as most of you know, found Greg guilty. Greg never heard from this boy again. Those of you who have heard Greg tell this story know that he can't tell it without crying, and I can't really either. My point is this. What we do as a church, what we do as General Conference delegates, has life and death consequences. Our discriminatory rules do grave harm on a daily basis to LGBTQI people in and beyond, far beyond our own pews. That harm falls disproportionately on the most vulnerable members of our communities. African LGBTQI people, for instance, and youth. Youth are so affected by what we do. Transgender people are disproportionately affected, and particularly trans women of color who suffer an epidemic of lethal violence in this country. That is what I need everyone in this room to understand about this conversation and about what we do as the General Conference of the United Methodist Church. Thank you. Thank you very much.